Hey, what's going on, Experience Church? Just want to take a moment and wish all the dads a happy Father's Day. I hope you have an incredible day today. And as I was praying for us as dads this week, I just was reminded that I never want to take for granted the responsibility, the opportunity, but also the privilege it is to be a dad. You know, I was thinking about not only uh, have my kids impacted me, but I have uh, an opportunity to impact them as well. And man, it's just awesome being a dad, isn't it? And so I hope you have an incredible day. Speaking of dads, uh, this week I have the incredible opportunity to spend some time with a spiritual father, Pastor Larry Stockstill. He's the founding pastor of Bethany Church in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. He's been in ministry for over 50 years, and so he's learned a thing or two. And so I get an opportunity just to, to learn, to grow, and get better as a husband, as a father, as a leader, as a pastor. And so I'm excited about what God's doing in my life this week. But not only do I get to hear from Pastor Larry, but you do as well. Uh, pastor Larry is going to be bringing the message for us today, and I'm excited about what God's going to do in all of our hearts, in all of our lives. And so let's get ready for Pastor Larry Stockstill. Hi, everybody. I'm Pastor Larry Stockstill. I'm the director of Pastors University. We have 90 pastors and 90 churches in our very first year where they're learning 50 lessons from 50 years. I've been in the ministry 50 years very excited that your pastor or someone from your staff is there with us during the four times coming to Baton Rouge. We're very excited, and, and I'm coming to you today really just as a special speaker for your pastor on Father's Day because I have a heart for fathering. I have six children. Uh, I'm not just pro-life. I'm prolific, by the way. You, you get it, right? I also just had my 16th grandchild, a little boy named Ethan. So I've been at this a long time. I've been married 44 years and on and on and on, but I had a, such a great father. My father died at 97. He lived with me his last seven years after my mom died. They were married 63 years. Daddy was in the ministry 68 years. So what a father example I had. But I realized that a lot of you didn't have a great father. In fact, that's a generational problem right now. We're dealing with what's called the fatherless generation. And I'm hearing questions like these. Can I give you a few? One question I, I saw once, is, is a father obsolete? Is it even needed anymore? Do we need fathers? I'll tell you why in this message. Secondly, is a relationship to a father necessary? And I believe they are. I'll share that too. Or does my relationship to my father determine my perception of God? Very much so. And I'll explain that. How can I be a better father in today's world? A lot of you, maybe young fathers, you're wanting to know the answer to that. Or what are some great examples of a father? I just named my own, and that's a great one. But finally, what is my personal experience with my father? What did I learn to do and what not to do? I know some of you that are watching me today are saying, man, my father was absentee. He was anonymous, not around, or even abusive. So many failures that fathers have had in our lives. So I'm going to cover all that in just a short 25-minute period. So you hitch it up. Let's go together, and let's take our minds toward Hebrews chapter 12, and I'm going to read verse 6 and 7, where the Apostle Paul talks about God as a father. Now, you can't get a better example than God as your father. Here's what he says. My son, don't despise the discipline of the Lord. For whom the Lord loves, I love that part, he disciplines and what son is there whom his father does not discipline? Would you pray with me right now? Father, I thank you that you love us. We can't even describe in words on this Father's Day how much you love us. But alongside that is the companion of your love. You discipline us. You change us. You challenge us. You coach us. You bring us to the next level. And I pray today that every dad, every father, every grandfather, every young person that's watching this in whatever church they're in would say, I want to be a father like God. 
In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, you know, let me go through these questions starting with that first one. God is a father, and we also always think about God is love. And that's true. John said it in his epistles over and over. God is love. He that does not love does not know God. Let me tell you one fact I know about God, his amazing love. The Bible says his love fills the highest heaven. That's the whole universe is full of his love. So if you've never felt a father's love, can I tell you, God the Father loves you enough to send his son Jesus to die for you. But you notice in the verse I just read, it doesn't really speak about his love. It speaks about his discipline. What son is there that his father does not discipline? You know, I discovered as a parent that if I really love my child, I'll stop them from foolish behavior. I'm going to stop them from things that could destroy their character, their marriage later in life, their business career. I love them enough to stop them. In fact, every time I spanked a child or disciplined them, I told them before and after how much I love them because love and discipline really go together. In fact, Proverbs says that he that does not love his child does not discipline him. Now, we have been called a fatherless generation, and I think that's important that people know that even though they happen to have a father, it does not mean their father spent the time to train and discipline them. We're going to talk about that a little further. Someone said fathering is obsolete. Here's my statement. Father is never obsolete because foolishness is never obsolete. I don't know about you, but I was pretty foolish as a kid. Come on now, be honest. And the Bible says foolishness is bound up in the heart of a child. This is Proverbs. But the rod of discipline will drive it far from him. Proverbs 22, 15. Now, I'm not going to speak on spanking today. I'm talking about discipline, though, and that's part of it. But let me just mention a couple of foolish things I did in my life. And I know you never did anything foolish, right? Look at your neighbor from a social distance and just tell him, I think he's talking about you right now. Come on. But see, notice the things that I did. I remember one time my sister and I were riding on a road behind our house I was in single file behind her. We were on a major road, and I don't know what got into me or what came out of me, but I decided to get up close to her and whack my front wheel against her back wheel and just hit her a little bit. And when I did, she lost control, and she fell all the way down into a ditch. And it horrified me. And then across the meadow, I heard my dad's voice saying, Larry. And I just saw him doing like that. In other words, you need to come to the house. You and I are about to have a time of fellowship. And we indeed did. I also remember another time my dad was a Baptist pastor. Every kid got up and went and got water during the service. All of them did. Their parents didn't care. They went to the bathroom. But my parents told me, you cannot get up during a service. Well, I just decided one service. I would position myself way over on the right-hand side or left-hand side facing my dad and get near the door. And surely he'd be facing the congregation. He wouldn't notice that I slipped up and went to go get water and what other foolishness I wanted to get into. So the moment was right, and I stepped up, and I made my way toward the door, and God is my witness. My dad stopped his message mid-sentence turned and looked at me and again with that voice said, Larry, where are you going? In front of about eight or 900 people. And I remember my little voice cracked. I said, to the bathroom. He said, no, son, you're not going anywhere. You have a seat right there. And I'll have to say he had another time of fellowship with me after church that night. I was full of foolishness. How about you? That's why I say fathering is never obsolete because foolishness is never obsolete. Discipline has to do, hear me carefully, even adults, with the will. Why does God love us enough to discipline our will? You ever been around a strong-willed child? Do you have one? Or were you one yourself? What did it take to stop you? You know, a strong-willed child can exasperate a mother. 
And I remember Melanie trying to spank our children sometimes, six, five boys and a girl. She'd get her little switch and close her eyes and just swing, man. And it was, it was hair, teeth, and eyeballs. It was bad because she gets so frustrated, so nervous, so worried. But, but that's really where the father comes in because the discipline of the father, can I describe it this way? It's the brick wall. It's the brick wall. He contributes the breaking of the will. A father, hear this statement, is supposed to break the will without breaking the spirit. That's important. You can discipline a child without breaking their spirit. If a child never learns to be submitted, though, they will never learn honor. They won't honor you. They won't honor their teachers. They won't honor the coach, the principal. They won't honor the policeman. They won't honor the college dorm person. They, they won't honor any authority because they never had their will exposed to something bigger than them. That's why the Bible says in Ephesians, honor thy father and your mother that your days may be long on the earth. For God, the reason he disciplines me and has broken my will and helped me to restrain my will is because he wants me to honor him. Now, the second question I ask is, how does your fathering, how does it influence your perception of God? That's, that, that, that's a good question. Here's Hebrews 12, 9 and 10. Besides this, we have had earthly fathers who disciplined us and we respected them. Shall we not much more be subject to the Father of spirits and live? For they disciplined us for a short time as it seemed best to them, but he disciplines us, that's talking about God, for our good, that we may share his holiness. I have been a father. I am a father. And can I tell you, I have been an imperfect disciplinarian. I've made mistakes I've made mistakes with my children. I've, I've now learned that at times I had even falsely accused them of something I suspected them of doing and unjustly accused them. Perhaps we disciplined them too harshly or not enough. Striking that perfect balance of not being ignorant of their devices and not being overbearing or not being too passive. It's not easy. It's sort of a hit and miss, and you occasionally hit it right down the center. God, on the other hand, is a perfect disciplinarian. Perfect. He never abuses, and the Bible says he only disciplines us for our good, that we may share in his holiness. God has an objective in disciplining me and you and you, your kids, and all of those things. It's that we may share in his holiness. Here's a third point I want to make, and I'm going to talk to all of you young fathers, those of you that have young children. I'm going to answer this third question for you. How can I be a better father in today's world? Now listen up. If you're in the process of fathering right now and you say, man, I don't know if I'm doing a good job. Man, I don't know if I, my kids are going to turn out all right. All six of my children serve the Lord. They all marry godly spouses. They're all in some form of ministry. And I give God the glory and I give my wife most of the credit for that. But can I just tell you, it works. Train up. Proverbs says, a child in the way they should go, not what they want to go, the, the way they should go. And when they're old, they'll not depart. If you're having a 16-year-old give you fits or a, a five-year-old, somebody talked about the terrible twos. Let me tell you, those terrible 20s ain't easy either because they make some pretty significant decisions in those years. Three points I want to give you if you want to become a better father. Number one, please write these down. Be unchangeable or unmovable. If you want to be a good father, you have to be consistent and fair. Now, I know we live in blended families everywhere. Sometimes you have two stepchildren, three of your own. And the question is, can you treat each child identically? In the Old Testament, we see that with Jacob, he treated Joseph as his favorite son. He made him a coat of many colors and all of the things that happened where his brothers were jealous, sold him into slavery. 
When I'm a favoritist with a child, I'm really breeding rebellion. I'm breeding anger and jealousy and hatred and sibling rivalry and all of that. So I made it my goal not to be lighter on my sixth child than I, than I was heavy on my first child. And that happens a lot. As children are born, they get easier and easier and easier on the discipline. Don't do that. Remember your standards. And if children don't know what you stand for, you're really destroying the image of God to a child because God never changes. He said that in Malachi, I am the Lord, I never change. And this is important because if they can't trust your convictions to stay the same or your positions to stay the same or your standards to always stay the same, then they can't trust God when he gives them his word. So that's why God tells you to command your children and to remain unchangeable because God gave his word to us and he will never change his word. So here, here, here I want to make a statement to you fathers. It takes time, T-I-M-E to enforce your standards. When you see a child that's acting up, throwing peas at the dinner table and, and they're doing all kind of stuff, your food is hot and you want to eat, it takes time to take that child out and apply the Board of Education to the seat of higher learning. Can I say it that way? That takes time. It can take time because you have to explain to them why they're getting discipline. Then you have to apply the discipline. Then you have to spend time telling them how much you love them and that it's not something that you've done out of, uh, out of not loving them. And then you have prayer with them. That can take 10, 12 minutes. You go back to cold food. And that happens 100 times. People say, I'm too busy to discipline my child. But never be too busy to deal with outright rebellion or untruth if they lie, or obstinance, or disrespect. And that's hard. When you hear a child, even a tone of voice that says, let's see what you got. Let's see if you're going to take the time to discipline me. When they challenge you, everything else goes on hold. You say, well, what if I'm in something I can't discipline them at that moment? Well, I learned something called my eyebrow. If I was in a cafeteria and one of them was acting up and they were throwing food or whatever, I call their name and I have a skill that my left eyebrow will go up while my right one is flat. You want to see me do it? It's that right there. That I call that the eyebrow. And when I call their name, Joel, Jared, when they looked at me, that eyebrow went up and I was saying in that, if you don't cease in your operation, desist in your maneuver, when we get home, there won't be enough comic books to put in the seat of your britches when I apply that board of education to the seat of higher learning. That's all in that eyebrow right there. I don't have to spank at that moment. I can inform them of what's coming. And if they change, I can, I can hold off on it. But if they don't, they cannot get me in a social position that keeps me from disciplining them at a later time. A child has to feel the brick wall, that they can't budget, that they can't manipulate it, that they can't be emotional, throw on the ground and stop breathing about it and throw tantrums. By the way, can I just tell you fathers some good news? If your child throws a tantrum and stops breathing on the ground, they will breathe again. I can just promise that. There's no way they're not going to take another breath. But that is how you cannot be manipulated. Remember, Dad, you're a brick wall. You're unchangeable. You're unmovable because consistency is critical. Here's number two. You want to be a better father. First, be unchangeable. Second, be encouraging. Oh, I love this point. This is important because if you look at Paul writing to Timothy and all of his 23 spiritual sons in the New Testament, he encouraged them. He told them how much he loved them. I know dads that have never once told their child, I love you. Well, listen, dad, that all changes today. I, I remember almost every day I told my children that I love them. And that I was proud of them. You say, what's that all about? I don't have to tell them I'm proud of them. But you don't understand the power of affirmation. Encouragement means that I am going to see anything a child does right 
and I'm going to compliment it for them. Anything I see that they do wrong and foolish and untrue and defiant, I'm going to let them know they've crossed a boundary and that they're going to be disciplined. But I need to equal out my discipline with my affirmation. Please, please write that down. You can't just be Mr. Discipline and Mr. Unmovable. The more affirmation they receive, the more discipline they want to receive. Please hear that because if they get attaboys from you over and over, when they get a I'm not pleased, it almost breaks their heart and they say, I don't like that. I want to get the other. This is so important. And even in our passage, the next verse says, lift up the drooping hands and strengthen the weak knees. Affirmation is so critical because they have to sense our pleasure as well as our pain. And can I say this statement? A father has to be fun. Every Monday night was our family night. You say, well, I don't have a family night. Well, you need to just start that this week if you've got young kids. Pick the night. But let them know that you're going to pop popcorn. You're going to make pizza. You're going to do anything that they want to do. You're going to watch any movie they want to watch. You're going to wrestle on the floor. You're going to tickle them. You're going to play chase in the house if your wife will let you. I did that. We play wolf and chase. And I do a wolf howl. They tried to find me. They never found me their whole life. But they loved it. They do that with their kids now. And can I tell you, family night, the phones were off. We didn't answer the door. That was my kids' night. And that was fun for us. And then we camped. You say, camp? I don't like a camp. I want to go to a five-star resort. But a kid loves to camp. Take them to a park. Build a fire. Roast weenies. Do something fun. Rough house with them. Camp, fish, golf, anything that gives them a picture of a God who is filled with joy and laughter. Can I tell you, our Father God is not long-faced with a white beard hanging to his belly button. God is full of joy. When the angels came to earth celebrating Christ's birth, what did they say? Glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace, goodwill toward men. God's a God of encouragement. I could go into some lengthy stories about times where I've affirmed my children when they felt they were failures. But I just remember playing basketball when the door would open and a five foot eight inch man would walk in and go up to the top of the bleachers. I knew who that was. It was my dad. And I don't know how I'd played in the game to that moment. But when I saw him walk in and sit up with his back against that wall up the top row, I played like a man from another world. I played hard defense. I shot three-pointers. I did everything because that was my dad that had walked in. Every child craves, craves your affirmation. You want to know why hundreds of thousands of kids are in gangs right now? They get more affirmation from those other kids than they do from a father. And many, many of them do not have a father in their life. So number one, be unmovable. Number two, be an encourager. But let's do the last one. Be an example. I've written a whole book called Model Man. I'm not going to talk about it, but it's about fathering and about so many things. But the reason I wrote that title, Model Man, Paul told Timothy, his son, he said, as a son to a father, I was an example to you. You know, I discovered that my kids imitated even the way I talk. In fact, now my kids laugh because they can imitate the way I preach, the way I talk. They know all my stories, all my jokes, all my they imitate you because fathering is not just about discipline. Fathering is providing a model, an example. Now, this is going to get hard, guys. If you're a dad and you're in the backyard and you've got a hammer and your thumb kind of gets too close to the hammer and you whack it real good, your little boy's standing there helping you, what comes out of your mouth next? If it turns the air blue, not good. What comes out of your mouth next? He will remember the rest of his life. That's a big, that's a tall order, isn't it, guys? To live it. To live it day to day. And we know we're not perfect. 
That's the problem. You may have to apologize to a child if you lose your temper or if you do something that was not something you would want him or her to imitate. But I wrote just a few of the things that they watch. They watch my prayer life. They watch my reactions to things. They watch my faith. They watch my consistency in church. They watch my tithing. They see me get out my checkbook and write it out to Bethany, my tithe. They watch my emotions and how I manage my emotions. They watch my work ethic. Does daddy like to go out and work and sweat around the house? That's important for them because they're going to need to know how to work. They, like, they watch my speech, my dress. How do I dress? They watch my habits. They watch my treatment of my wife, my dear brother's Remember that every way I treat my wife is how my children are going to treat their spouse. If I have anything negative to say, it needs to be behind closed, locked doors and with a quiet voice. There's a way to disagree without being disagreeable because you're a model. You're an example. I'm going to close with this one story. I was at a mall here in Baton Rouge. We had a big 15 passenger van, you know, six kids and us. And, and so we had a big old thing. And we were driving up a traffic lane. You know how the cars park on either side of the lane in a huge mall parking lot? We're driving up. And I noticed a car was stopped right in the middle of the traffic lane. And it was surrounded by about eight or ten teenage boys. And they were hanging in the car windows. I guess there were girls in the car. I don't know. But I pull up behind them, and I'm about maybe 30, 40 feet behind them. And when I pulled up, they didn't even, they didn't even acknowledge that they were holding me up, that I couldn't go around them, no way, couldn't back up. So there I sit, and they didn't even acknowledge. Finally, after about 15 seconds, they looked up and just saw me sitting there. But they just kept going with what they were doing. Now 30 seconds go by, which seems like an eternity a minute goes by, and I'm thinking, well, any moment they're going to just move out of the way. But then I realized, actually, they were taunting and challenging me. And I'm sitting there in the seat, and these guys were not very big. And my boys started pushing on me. This was my kids in the back. They said, go get them, Dad. My boys. They said, go get them, Dad. You can take all of them. Go get them. And I'm sitting there looking at them, and I, I felt myself getting so upset and I just, I was just before putting my hand on the handle and walking out there and, and, and just getting unchristian for a minute. Help me, Lord. But the Lord spoke to me while I was sitting there. And he said, what you do right now, your children will remember for the rest of their life and imitate. And I just kept saying, I want to give glory to God for his grace in that moment. Because that thing went maybe two, three minutes and God gave me the calmness and the patience to just sit there, hearing it from both ends. And then all of a sudden, the boy moved his car, and the kids got out of the way, and we passed on through. Never looked back. Example. I wish I had certain times that I could go back and relive. But I'm telling every father, particularly young father today, be unmovable, be fair. Be a brick wall. Don't be, don't be manipulated by children's tantrums and all. And then be encouragement. Balance your discipline with encouragement. And finally, be an example. I want to just stop and close this message. And thank you again for having your pastor come to Pastors University. Actually, we're going to be studying what I'm teaching you right now. We're going to be studying in the term that they're coming in uh, the next month. Now, I want to pray for you. Would you just stop a moment, close your eyes, and just sit there and remember your own father. He may be passed on. He may be alive. You say, well, my father wasn't good to me. He was abusive. He was hurtful. He was harmful. But the Bible still says, honor your father and your mother. I want you to pray a prayer asking God to forgive your father for what he did to you. Would you do that right now? Just say, Father, help me to forgive and I pray you would forgive them for what they've done in my life that was wrong. And then I want you with your eyes closed to see Jesus hanging on the cross. He's bloody from head to foot. He has two nails in his hands and he has one or two in his feet. They don't know exactly how many. 
And I want you to see him in the agony there, saying, Father, why have you forsaken me? The father loved Jesus. That's his only son. But he turned his back on his own son that you and I might be forgiven by his blood. Now, that's love. You say, I don't know if God loves me. Look at the cross and you see his love. He could have sent 12 legions of angels and wiped out the Roman Empire to rescue his son, but he didn't. Because he wanted you to receive his forgiveness. If you don't know Jesus Christ, if you don't know him for sure in your life, you don't know God as a father, you've never had that good example in your life, and you say, I want God as my father. I want Jesus as my elder brother. I want to receive my forgiveness. Just put your hand right over your heart, right in your seat there, and just pray this to yourself out loud or to yourself. Say, Heavenly Father. Today I come to you, and I need forgiveness. Wash me in the blood of Jesus. Forgive my past and make me a brand new person. And now, Father, I receive Christ as Lord. I speak it out of my mouth. Jesus Christ is now my Lord. And Father, by the way, would you forgive my earthly father for the areas where they were not your image to me, for the hurts, the disappointments, and the failures in their lives. And I receive my forgiveness. Now with your eyes closed, I want you to just reach out to heaven and begin to praise God. Come on, every person, every church, just say thank you, Lord, that you are my Father who art in heaven. Hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give me today my daily bread. And forgive me of my transgressions as I forgive those who transgress against me. And lead me not into temptation, but deliver me from evil. For yours is the kingdom, the power, and the glory. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. I love you. And thank you for giving us your pastor in 2020.